Yesterday, Damascus, the old city, was rocked by a series of shells and missiles fired from East Gotha. These are the last throws of East Gotha. The terrorists who are Saudi backed that are based there are now about to face Syria's elite Tiger Force. Tiger Force arrived in Damascus only a few days. They're busy in preparation for an assault on East Gotha. No longer will the 350 to 400,000 people held captive under the yoke of terrorism will be used as human shields. No longer will Damascus be rained with fire from Saudi-backed terrorists. The writing is on the wall. Take heed. Surrender. Because you're now up against the elite. For many years, the Eastern Ghouta was in the forefront of the military rebellion against the Syrian government. The area is controlled by a combination of different Islamist Salafist armed groups, such as Jaysh al-Islam, Ahrar al-Sham, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, Aka al-Qaeda, and Failak al-Rahman. Some of these groups are supported by Saudi Arabia, others by Turkey and Qatar. That explains the continuous inter-rebel conflict in Eastern Ghouta, which resulted in the death of hundreds of civilians. The Islamist militants in Eastern Ghouta have registered one of the worst war crimes and crimes against humanity during the discourse of the war in Syria. For example, on December 11, 2013, around 6 o'clock in the morning, a large number of militants from eastern Ghouta infiltrated the industrial city of Adra, northeast of Damascus, attacking buildings, housing workers and their families. The Islamist militants have targeted religious minorities, killing, beheading and even burning civilians alive in the ovens of the bread factory for sectarian motives. A Syrian opposition figure who was in touch with people in the area said the militants tried to kill a man with his family but he took out a grenade he had with him and blew it up killing himself his wife mother brother and son and several of his attackers. Jaysh al-Islam, which was part of Adra invasion, captured many civilians, mainly women and children, and put them later on in cages, claiming that the group doing this to prevent Syrian army bombardment on eastern Ghouta. Shamelessly, many mainstream media outlets promoted Jaysh al-Islam propaganda and refrained from condemning this barbaric act. In late September 2014, the Syrian army recaptured the town of Adra and 5,000 civilians returned to their homes. Above all, the militants in East Ghouta fired thousands of rockets, hell cannons and missiles over the residential areas in Damascus, killing hundreds of civilians since 2012. In short, the armed groups in Eastern Ghouta are not only anti-democratic but also sectarian and genocidal. The Syrian army conducted several attempts to recapture East Ghouta but several factors prevented it. Number one, the militants in Jobar and Ghouta have dug tens of tunnels creating a city under the city, which complicated the military operation. This guerrilla warfare technique has been taught mainly by Hamas military officers who turned their back to Syria. Second, there were other military priorities, particularly the liberation of Aleppo and the resort, in addition to connecting the main cities together and crushing the existential threat imposed by ISIS. But now, after stopping the military operation in Idlib and defeating ISIS in most areas, the Tiger forces headed by General Suhail Hassan heading towards Damascus in order to liberate East Ghouta and protect the capital from the daily threat of terrorism. We don't know yet the military strategy of the Syrian army and from which side the ground attack will happen, but what we know for sure is that this battle would be one of the fiercest since the beginning of the war in Syria. on something that Sarah Flounders mentioned, which is that uh, today in the General Assembly, the representative of my country, Canada, is raising or has raised a resolution which is not about human rights, it's not about uh, the people of Syria. It's a resolution meant to point fingers and to vilify the governments of Syria and Russia. And this resolution relates to a UN Security Council resolution that was vetoed by Russia and China some days ago. That resolution pertained to another useless ceasefire in Syria, which would have no bearing on, uh, no bring no good to the people of Syria, and which follows um, a week of liberation of areas of Aleppo, which now amounts to about 7 or 95 percent of areas of Aleppo that have been occupied for years by terrorist factions. 
So at this time, when 100,000 civilians in these areas occupied for years by terrorist factions have been liberated, the UN, uh, parties in the UN wanted to impose another ceasefire. And I, I want to remind people why these ceasefires are indeed pointless. The last ceasefire in September was from the very um, start negated by 20 main terrorist factions who declared they were not going to participate and from the very beginning violated the ceasefire over 300 times during the duration of the ceasefire. And not only these terrorist factions, while the Syrians and while the Russians um, adhered to the tenets of the ceasefire, but the American-led coalition itself violated the ceasefire by targeting Syrian army positions in Deir ez-Zor, killing at least 83 Syrian soldiers in a prolonged attack that lasted nearly one hour and which enabled ISIS to, over, to overtake that position. So this is one reason why a ceasefire is pointless at this point in time. There is no faith that any of the parties that the U.S. and Western leaders who uh, have funded these terrorists, there's no faith that they can actually control the terrorists and get them to adhere to a ceasefire. And the people of Aleppo want Aleppo to be completely freed. And I speak having been to Aleppo four times, and this is the will of people in Aleppo. Um, so on that note, I'd just like to talk about um, briefly, I've been to Syria six times since 2014, two of which were with um, international delegations and four times were independently on a visa I applied for, paid for and waited for. Um, my trips have been self-funded or fundraised and I've gone at my own risk and been able to travel freely in the country to areas I wish to travel to. I've been many times to Homs, to Malula, to Latakia, Tartus, um, Siath, Sueda, and again, Aleppo four times. And I mention these because I think it's important people realize I have, in, wherever I've gone, I've spoken in Arabic to the people I'm speaking with. What uh, Donna, what Sarah have said, the, that the people support their army and government is absolutely true. Whatever you hear in the corporate media is the complete opposite. And on that note, what you hear in the corporate media, and I will name them BBC, Guardian, New York Times, etc., on Aleppo is also opposite of reality. Uh, nowadays, wars are everywhere. And unfortunately, as a diplomat, I could witness uh, that uh, since 1945, instead of decreasing the number of wars all over the world, the war number, the war's number have increased twice, mm, mm. twice, although we created the United Nations to stop the war. Mm -hmm. And it is written in the introduction of the Charter of the United Nations. That means the, huma the humanity failed. Mm. You know that we are 193 nations, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. member states. Uh, theoretically speaking, we are saying that we are equal to each other. But really, realistically speaking, we are not equal to each other. Some are too little, some are too weak, some are too dependent, some are not independent, really speak. Some are following uh, others' agendas, uh, blindly speaking. But to be honest with you, many ambassadors, many diplomats, many countries, let's say, here present at the, at the United Nations, are easily in, impressed by pressure. Mm -hmm. they, they don't resist the pressure. They give up easily. I mean, many ambassadors uh, come to me after voting against my, my country. They vote against Syria, but then they come to me to apologize. Ambassador, we are sorry. We are with you. We understand you. We know that you are right, but we did it because we got instructions from the we capitals the to do so. Of their so they know the truth. They know that Syria has been a victim of a huge international uh, manipulation of international law as well as of facts. They know that and they acknowledge while speaking to me personally. Would United States or France or Britain or Canada or Japan or Australia or anybody, would any of these nations allow another nation to support a so-called moderate armed opposition in these countries to overthrow the uh, ruling governments? We shouldn't be naive. What they did to us is unprecedented. They have been manipulating all the decision-making mechanisms at the United Nations. You have mentioned a few minutes ago a very key word, which is reporting. You know what? All the so-called experts in this uh, organization are either uh, from the West or people working for the West. 
So you may not expect any report on Syria to be genuine. This is how they manipulate the facts, by, by misleading the mm. members of the Security Council with wrong information yeah. about Syria. And this is the, the other side of the story. We are not alone, we have too many friends, too many friends. Many times the, our enemies in the Council try to uh, impose resolutions allowing them to use force against us, the way they did it to Iraq. Mm -hmm. Although uh, when they invaded Iraq, their invasion was illegal and illegitimate because they didn't get the authorization from the Council. So themselves also, they learned from their mistakes in Iraq. They tried to avoid their, these mistakes by getting a resolution from the Security Council allowing them to use force. They couldn't. Seven Russian and Chinese vetoes. That's incredible. Prevented them from doing so. So we are not alone. We have too many friends.